So I am excited to say that my first book is about to come out in a few months, but I'm sorry to tell you that there's nothing from it in this talk. <laughs> so what you're gonna hear today is the early stages of this newer project, and it's the, the case studies that I think will structure what I would like to be the first chapter. But the connective tissue hasn't been fully woven, and I'm really interested in your ideas. So in the spring of 2023, Samsung was accused of lying to consumers about how its smartphones could photograph the moon. The Galaxy S21 and S23 had been marketed as worth the cost, 1,200 US dollars for the S23, due to significant camera advances. Advertisements boasted amazing astrophotographs to demonstrate what Samsung called its 100 times space zoom, which uses computational techniques to go far beyond the optical capacities of the tiny lenses on a smartphone, and showed off a camera feature called ultra moon mode. To use moon mode, you would just open the camera app and point toward the moon and pinch and zoom to bring its on-screen image closer. Object recognition algorithms would identify this was the moon, and then computer vision processes would automate adjustments to optimize the image. The results were remarkable. These two images were made on the same night, right next to one another, um, one with moon mode and one with an iPhone 12. And you can see how poorly the moon shows up on the pretty good iPhone 12 camera. But the moon images seemed too good to be true when moon mode. Blog bloggers began to post and scrutinize them, trying to understand how handheld snapshots made with tiny smartphones could turn out better than long exposure images taken with high resolution DSLR cameras equipped with tripods and telephoto lenses. Skeptics designed experiments to test and fool moon mode, like would it paste craters onto this ping pong ball? It didn't. But accusations built that instead of simply zooming in, moon mode must be using AI to overlay or composite from pre-recorded imagery, filling in details that could not have actually been captured. These suspicions about moon mode recirculate, of course, long-standing anxieties about how a photograph could serve as proxy for or improve upon an eyewitness view. Bringing the moon impossibly close through techniques of computational photography resonates with ways photography had seemed to deliver marvels when it was a much newer medium, revealing ghosts and fairies through forms of double exposure and compound printing that were soon decried as deception. Accusations about overlays even more directly reveal how, recall how photographers like Edward Mybridge, long before AI or even Photoshop, might mix multiple negatives to transpose the fluffier clouds or the fuller moon from one landscape's sky to another. But the suspicions about moon mode also restage a more specific challenge in trying to picture the moon. Within view, but out of reach, the moon is a special case for our symposium's topic of seeing at a distance. It's near enough to see with the naked eye from anywhere on Earth, which makes it seem much closer than much nearer things. Like tonight, we could all go out and see the moon, but try seeing California, or Spain, or Italy, or any place that's just much closer than the moon, um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna see it. So the moon has this intimate distance and it impacts our life on Earth in material ways, reflecting light and pulling tides. But it's also strictly beyond the limits of our human world and our embodied grasp, where Earth's atmosphere and gravity give way. It's a tipping point into the cosmos, as Galileo showed. It orbits us as we orbit the sun, as our solar system spins in the Milky Way, which swirls among other galaxies in a cosmos beyond our conception. So trying to see the moon comes up against limits that are more than technological, and no level of zoom could resolve them. But changing visual technologies continually renegotiate how those limits appear. They test aims and assumptions about how to see what remains out of reach by way of its image. So new ways to see and visualize the moon mark broader shifts in how visual mediation works and what it seems to mean. In this short talk, I want to recount just a few examples of many of how the moon has been mediated. 
because I think they're one place that we can look to watch how the problem of seeing at a distance is repeatedly reformulated. Oops, that's wanting the man. In 1609, um, Galileo looked up at the moon through a telescope. To draw what he saw, however, he also had to look away from it and down at sheets of paper where he tried to render in ink what he could only otherwise see with one eye pressed to the device. The illustrations published in Sidereus Nuncius looked like this, prints made from woodcuts. But the woodcuts were carved from wash drawings made with a brush to combine fine lines and thin layers of diluted ink. These images use the pale background of paper and the layered opacity of ink to explore interrelationships of light and shadow. Galileo made a series of images over multiple nights showing the moon as the sun's light reflected differently off its surface. His drawings are a definitive example of scientific observation and a turning point in the history of science, but they're also aesthetic mediations. Still lives are, I even think of them as portraits, drawn from life by a man trained as an artist. Galileo's understanding of perspective and chiaroscuro and how these translate between three-dimensional objects and two-dimensional images helped him not only to depict but to understand the surface of the moon. It was said to be smooth, of course, like all heavenly bodies were presumed to be. And with one eye through a telescope, the moon would indeed appear as flat as a two-dimensional image. But looking at the moon night after night, Galileo studied and drew this play of light and shadow to decipher what must be a crater, what must be a mountain, relaying between eye and hand, sky and paper, view and drawing to grasp the material contours of the moon's rough surface. It was not just the telescope, but this process of drawing that, as he put it, revealed the moon with all the certainty of sense evidence. More than 200 years later, the moon was one of the first subjects for photography and astrophotography. Daguerre is said to have made an exposure that was lost, but when the astronomer Francois Arago announced Daguerre's invention, he emphasized that it was so sensitive it would react to moonlight, which most chemical processes that, that are reactive to light won't. He predicted it would be used to allow the moon to map itself. The way sunlight hits the moon's surface to make it visible on Earth at night almost seemed to anticipate or double the way that moonlight could in turn strike a photosensitive plate to inscribe an image inside the dark chamber of a camera. But these conditions also make the moon especially difficult to photograph. Its brightness against a dark sky invites overexposure, and the relative weakness of moonlight needs a longer exposure. But collecting more light over time requires compensating for the fact that both the Earth and the moon are moving. One of the first photographs of the moon, this daguerreotype by John Draper, seems to register almost this instability, as if the moon stutters across the plate or is shifting phases. Clockwork drive mechanisms were soon devised to slowly move a telescope, keeping something centered in view and therefore stable on the photographic plate over a longer exposure time. But images captured this way were still unstable in the way any daguerreotype was. You might get to hold this little moon in your hands fixed as an image, but depending how you tilted the polished metal plate and how the light hit its reflective surface, the image could appear as a positive or a negative or might not be visible at all. Again, this seemed to retain something of the moon's own qualities of changeability and reflected light, confounding efforts to capture it more completely. Glass negatives and paper prints soon brought the moon, excuse me, soon seemed to fix the moon more firmly. And one astronomer in particular devised a unique way for photographs to bring it more viscerally within reach. In the late 1850s and early 1860s, Warren uh, De La Rue came up with a strategy to create stereoscopic views of the moon. This paired images showing the moon from different perspectives so that when viewed through a stereoscope, it would appear with an effect of three-dimensional depth. This was difficult to do because the same side of the moon is always turned to the Earth, even as they both rotate. And there's nowhere far enough to get on Earth to see a different perspective of the moon. It's so far away. 
So the moon does tilt and wobble a bit over the year, which is called its libration. And this slightly changes how its face is angled and appears from the Earth. So to capture images that could simulate a shift in visual perspective, De La Rue photographed the moon at two different times of year, about six months apart, catching the moon in the same phase, but with different libration. He made a series of stereo views this way, first as glass positives, which were then re-photographed and, and distributed as paper stereographs. There's an account of an 1858 exhibition that used a special stereoscope with his glass positives, enlarged to eight inches in diameter, so that the viewer supposedly saw the moon with perfect rotundity. Even today, to look at one of the smaller stereographs or, uh, or the glass uh, stereo views in an ordinary stereoscope, the moon pops from image to object in a startling way. I, I can tell you I have looked at many stereo views and this one is the most amazing, I think, because no matter how many high resolution images you've seen of the moon, and no matter how often you have looked up at it, you have never seen it with perceptual depth, looking as round as an orange, seeming to hover right in front of you. As familiar as the moon may be, the distance between our eyes is just too small for enough parallax to see it in the night sky with any embodied sense of depth. When the astronomer John Herschel saw De La Rue's stereographs, he described the effect as seeing the way a giant might with eyes spaced thousands of miles apart. In other words, bringing the moon so close required distortions that seemed to undermine any conception of that proximity. Looking at De La Rue's stereo view was like looking through Galileo's telescope in that the image is contingent on actively using the device. But while Galileo made his drawings from his view through the telescope, De La Rue's stereo view relies on the prior photographs. The moon that appears through the stereoscope shows up with the same visceral certainty that Galileo emphasizes about his eyewitness observations, but is, is also absolutely a trick, a compound image of moons seen months apart in which that temporal difference is somehow staged as spatial presence. Another way of compounding images to construct virtual presence was practiced a century later when cameras were launched into space. In 1966, NASA's Surveyor 1 was the first mission to land a camera on the moon's surface and transmit images back to Earth. Over about one month, it sent more than 11,000 images via radio antenna. Each still image was made up of 600 lines converted from, ooh, that's Surveyor 1. This is the camera that was on it, and this is, um, a diagram explaining how it works, which I, th I understand more after talking with um, Anne Katrine. So um, each, each still image was made up of uh, 600 lines converted from light energy to the electric charge of a photoconductive surface that an electron beam scanned across. I also think this is in the, in the history of uh, the Durand's selenium too, right? Sometimes three sets of data were sent for the same frame, like the faxing earlier today, captured with different RGB filters uh, to be reassembled into one color image. On Earth, the wavelengths sent from Surveyor were recorded on magnetic tape and then converted into visual information using what NASA called digital computer techniques that had been developed to process images in earlier Ranger and Mariner missions. This involved several types of correction and noise filtering as uh, illustrated by this sequence, and it ended with images printed to 35 millimeter film. Some sets of those prints made at small scale called chips were assembled into mosaics like these. And some of the mosaics were assembled inside dark half spheres whose curvature was meant to correct for the perspectival distortions of the camera's panoramic rotation. Image chips were glued piece by piece by hand, and then this three dimensional assemblage was rephotographed to appear flat in the plane of another image. So that image could be reprinted on the pages, for example, of reports, like the one I'm showing you a page of, 
and one where the artist via Selmans eventually found one. Here you can see how Selmans used masking tape to physically reframe part of the image on the flat page of the printed report. It's frames within frames within lines and it's so many layers. So over many months between 1971 and 72, she made this drawing, Moon Surface Surveyor One. You can see how she retained the distinction between image chips in the mosaic, um, even as her pencil marks shared a single surface. Her image is larger than the one found in the report, which had shrunk <laughs> the, the chips already, right? And it looks more overexposed than the chips seen in the other prints. So it's as if her rendering is a photographic enlargement or re-exposure. Like Galileo, who drew what he saw through the telescope, Salmons also was transposing an already mediated view onto paper through her own act of seeing and drawing. And like looking at one of De La Rue's stereographs, her effort seems to fuse images that also remain discrete, creating a different register of visibility through and at the scale of embodied perception. Like Galileo worked with ink wash to explore how relationships of light and shadow conveyed the moon's contours, Selman's layers of graphite resonate with the texture of the moon's surface that Surveyor One was sent in particular to study in preparation for Apollo's manned landing. But the texture of pencil on paper also resonates with the photographic grain of images printed on 35 millimeter film, which in turn recast the resolution of these 600 lines electronic scans. Selman's drawing is understood as a work of fine art, an aesthetic mediation, but she was also enacting a form of eyewitness observation and exacting transcription that are more usually associated with science and machine forms of inscription. The distinction between all these are quietly reshuffled in her mediation of the moon. These distinctions are renegotiated again by the processes that now enable moon mode. The accusations made against Samsung in 2023 actually repeated the very same accusations made about moon mode when it first appeared in Huawei smartphones in 2019. In both cases, smartphone makers were asked to explain the trick. And in both cases, they denied any deception, insisting there were no overlays and nothing was being faked. Since last spring, Samsung has published diagrams and descriptions about how moon mode works, fending off this bad press. Um, and these serve as a more general primer about how AI powers computational photography. It seems that Samsung and Huawei both purchased the code for moon mode from the third party company ArcSoft who trained a machine learning model on photographs of the moon. So the whole history of mediating the moon becomes the archive for, training, for training a computer vision algorithm to predict what an image of the moon should look like. Because the moon doesn't change much, an algorithm trained this way can identify pixel patterns in what would otherwise come out as a very blurry image and extrapolate not only where, for example, specific craters must be, but also how tones should be rendered relative overall patterns of light and shade in the image. Moon mode uses automated corrections to optimize how features of the moon are resolved, sharpening shadows and lines and balancing focus and lighting. So moon mode is not pasting in overlays, but what shows up on your screen is also not a one-to-one -one imprint of how photons hit a sensor array in the moment you pressed a button but neither are any other images you make with a smartphone. Moon mode relies on techniques that are now used in almost all computational photography, which means all smartphone photography. So its images are only fake to the extent that all your selfies and vacation photos and pet photos and all your, all your photos are. So in a way, we already know this, right? We know that skin is being smoothed and sky is made bluer. So the trouble with moon mode isn't as much about fake photographs alarm um, as that norm structuring photography had already changed. And it's almost as if we had to look toward the moon, pinching and zooming out as far as our view could reach to see what otherwise had escaped our notice because it's too close, quite literally at our fingertips and these, image, these uh, objects were touching and taking images with constantly. <laughs> 
So efforts to bring the moon closer test the reach of new visual technologies, often as those technologies are becoming a new norm. But instead of bringing the moon close, closer, these tools and techniques, whether it's a telescope or a stereoscope or a camera on the moon, they restructure what counts as proximity. They reorganize how we would distinguish a direct observation or an aesthetic mediation, an accurate view or an unreliable representation. And this is one reason, I think, why new ways of seeing the moon are so often caught up in controversies, large and small, from Galileo's role in the Copernican Revolution to conspiracy theories about the televised moon landing through accusations about AI faking photographs and many other interesting examples along the way, like the great moon hoax where they said they discovered Batman living on the moon through the biggest telescope on Earth because telescopes had just gotten a whole lot better, right? It was again, these, these tend to correlate with major shifts in, a, in visual technology. So different ways of seeing at a, different, at a distance pressure, reveal, and sometimes reorder the boundary conditions for visibility and visual, visual mediation. The moon is both a case study and I think a material analogy of this problem or this possibility. Because when we look toward the moon, we continually encounter the limits of that look, and the very instances in which we seem to see and grasp it are also the fragments and reflections through which it continues to elude us. And this I wanted to end with, it's um, the sort of camera obscura effect of gaps in between leaves that you can watch an eclipse this way safely, um, but you see it in this multiplication, so even whether what begins to count as mediation and what doesn't, what's the view and what's the image is um, complicated before we have all the televisual technologies in a sense, right? So even before the telescope, there was a tree. Thank you.